I thank you all for joining us for the, the pause webinar this morning. Um, this morning we have uh, Jimbo Wong, who is also a member of the pause panel. Uh, <clears throat> he's going to be talking to us about uh, op observing upper ocean uh, through uh, surface water and ocean topography, as well as the winds and currents mission for the next decade. Uh, Jimbo got his PhD from uh, the MIT Woods Hole Joint Program and uh, went on to do a postdoc at Scripps and since 2015 has been a scientist at uh, JPL uh, where he has been working on uh, the SWAT missions and the, the WACA mission. So um, we're excited to hear about the future of these missions and uh, ocean observing from remote sensors. Uh, so thank you, Jimbo. Hey, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, the opportunity. Uh, so today I will be talking about two satellite missions that will let us better understand the upper ocean circulation. Uh, first, the surface water and ocean topography mission, the so-called uh, SWAT mission, um, will observe sub 100 kilometer scale sea surface height with wide swaths. The satellite, um, so the satellite will be launched in November this year. The second mission is the called Winds and the Currents mission called Wacom. Uh, it is recommended by 2018 Decadal Survey and currently in the proposal phase. Uh, it will observe simultaneous wind vector and the ocean surface currents uh, through a key band pencil beam Doppler scatterometer. Uh, SWAT has two components. The surface water means terrestrial water, lakes and rivers. The ocean topography means the sea surface height. Uh, there is also an additional exciting element at their interface, which is the estuaries and the coastal sea levels. Uh, here, my focus in this talk is the open ocean. So this presentation package is a result of a, an extensive collaboration with Manning, SWAT, and the Wacom colleagues. I start to list all the names, but uh, it's, it's, it's more than one page, so I uh, just put my na my name there, but definitely is a teamwork. And also, I want to acknowledge uh, the support from SWAT, from GPL Strategic Wacom uh, Fund, uh, from GPL PDRDF and NASA PO program, and, uh, and SWAT and the Wacom colleagues. So, uh, let's next uh, slide. So this is all line of my talk. Uh, I will first briefly talk about the need to monitor the upper ocean at small scales, then discuss uh, altimetry and the SWOT and the SWOT science requirement and the mission collaboration and the validation station plans. Uh, after that, I will focus on some key results of a recent field campaign and uh, the mission final post-launch oceanography field campaign plan. And then I will briefly introduce uh, the measurement principle and the science potentials of potentials of Wacom mission at the end. Um, okay. So, uh, first of all, why is the upper ocean important? Uh, it is well known that the ocean absorbed more than 93% of the Earth energy imbalance due to the greenhouse gases. Uh, studying the ocean's role in the climate system is vitally important for climate science and for prediction of future climate. Uh, which is very intuitive right now uh, after we uh, quantify the effect of the ocean absorption of, uh, of heat. So the sea surface uh, is at the interface of the atmosphere and ocean, and the upper ocean is the interface between the sea surface and deep ocean. So in other words, the upper ocean is, is the ocean component of air, air sea transition zone. Um, we need to better monitor the upper ocean circulation to improve our understanding and also our model uh, predict, predicting skills. Now, I want to just to give you a visual of the small scale ocean, feature, uh, ocean features from a, from a global perspective. This figure shows the surface relative vorticity snapshot from a two kilometer resolution global ocean simulation. Uh, the clusters of small-scale eddies are obvious and have spatial distributions connected to large-scale ocean circulation, as well as the seasonal variations, uh, which is not shown in this figure. Um, so, 
these small scale structures look like a numerical noise from a global view. But if we zoom in, for example, in this black box near Kerguelen Plateau, we can see more interesting structured ocean turbulence. They contribute to the significant portion of vertical uh, eddy heat flux, but they are not measured by current satellite altimeters or other satellite, nor resolved by the climbing models. Now, if we continue to zoom in to see more structures of this turbulence field, the level of turbulent continuum is not a surprise in theory. We know that, right? We know the turbulence cascade, but the features we see are beyond the conventional picture painted by wave number spectrum, for example, in the context of an energy cascade. Uh, these are coherent structures, uh, has very strong heterogeneous uh, generality, and they will benefit from a two-dimensional view from satellite uh, measurement. So the concept of wide swath altimeter started about 20 years ago. After 20 years of uh, development, SWAT will finally fly soon in this year. So it targets the fine scale ocean dynamics that cannot be resolved by the conventional needle altimeter. Here we show an example in this, uh, uh, in this blue marble that uh, the current long track altimeter uh, shown by the red lines, first of all, is a profile measurements along the satellite orbit. A second, they are uh, they have large spatial gaps uh, between the tracks. So, interpolating this along track can give us a good picture of large uh, scale ocean circulation and large massive scale uh, eddies in this picture as a, actually is a SST. Uh, but they are not enough of, uh, for smaller eddies. If we zoom into this, this eddy, we can see these uh, small scale eddies on the uh, edge of large massive scale eddies. Uh, but those structures, as we know, that are important, um, especially in the transporting vertically of the heat and, and carbon and other tracers, and it influence the ocean ventilation and air interaction. So that's the small scale. Uh, Small massive scale ocean circulation is uh, ocean circulation is the target of uh, SWAT mission. Here is a, just a, another example. We analyzed uh, the heat transport of the fine scale eddies and found that the account for vertical heat transport five times larger than the massive scales. And uh, these eddies also show a strong seasonality. Uh, you can see from the, the contrast between March and uh, September, uh, northern hemisphere uh, versus southern hemisphere. Uh, SWAT aims to resolve these fine, uh, fine scale structures and uh, study their dynamics and, and influence to a uh, climate system. So how will SWAT achieve these goals? Uh, SWAT used a key band radar interferometer, which is very different from needle altimeter. It will directly, okay. it will directly break the two limitations in needle altimeter. The expected, uh, expected instrument noise is uh, uh, a 50 fold um, uh, uh, smaller, lower than the needle altimeter. Uh, it also produces wide swath two dimensional measurements. These two advancements will be able to reveal these fine scale ocean features that are absent uh, uh, so far in the, in the, in the satellite altimetry. Uh, at the same time, there will be uh, adjacent class. Uh, a needle altimeter on board a SWAT satellite and provide long wavelength uh, validation and to ensure the continuity of the satellite altimetry. Um, the launch date will be November uh, 2022 this year. The first 90 days will be uh, instrument checkoff. The second 90 days is for instrument calibration and validation. Uh, during this period, uh, the satellite will fly along a one day repeat uh, Cavalier orbit, uh, orbit uh, showing in this. In this figure, uh, after that, uh, the satellite will switch to the science orbit with a 21 day repeat cycle. Um, uh, worth, worth emphasizing that uh, SWAT is an international mission involving NASA, CNAS, a Canadian space, spatial, uh, space agency, sorry for the toggle, and, uh, and the UK uh, space uh, agency. Okay, now, now we switch the gear to focus on one thing, which is the satellite calibration validation. 
uh, it is a crucial task for linking the satellite signal to true and physically meaningful measurements. So conventional needle altimeter uh, depends on several stations near shore uh, under the satellite ground path. Uh, three stations are showing this figure on the right panel at uh, Corsica, Bastrade, and Harvest. So this photo shows the Harvest platform uh, on the left. Uh, we conduct satellite validation uh, calibration by comparing satellite measurement uh, with the ground measurement at these stations. So it is a point to point uh, comparison for uh, conventional needle altimeter. Uh, but it's, it, will be, it will be different for uh, uh, SWOT because the SWOT measurement requirement is specified on different, uh, different metrics. So after the instrument check on, the satellite flies on a fast one day repeat orbit for 90 days. Um, this cavalry orbit re uh, reduces the spatial, uh, no, it reduces the temporal um, uh, gaps at the cost of a spatial coverage. So over uh, the crossover locations, such as this one, um, we'll get two passes a day. Uh, that will give us enough samples for a short period to do instrument calibration and validation. The mission cavalry will focus on crossover location west of California in this region, but that, <clears throat> excuse me, there will be uh, tens of other cavalry sites from international community. Uh, the name for that um, uh, working group is uh, is called Adopt a Crossover Activities. You can see the symbols of this uh, ship um, for each crossover. So, um, it, you know, international team from different countries all contribute uh, for different uh, crossover location in on this map. Uh, this is a busy slide. Um, I will skip a lot of details, but just point out some some important uh, point in this in this slide. Uh, as SWAT will be the first um, altimetry mission that uses interferometry, calibration and validation is extremely important. We need to understand and validate the new measurements uh, at the beginning of the mission to get ready for subsequent uh, science studies. Uh, the target is the science requirement shown in this uh, in this figure. Um, the SWAT science requirement is built uniquely on wave number spectrum, not point by point measurement uh, comparison anymore. Is uh, a spectrum of the error that we need to figure it out. Uh, I will not go into the detail. Probably will take another hour. But in a nutshell, the target of the mission calibration is to compare satellite measurements against independent ground truth and their difference then is used to, to compare the science requirement, which is the, the red line here. So if we ca uh, calculate the difference between uh, SWOT and ground truth, the error should be below this red line. So that's what we will do during the KOL phase. Well, I will be happy to talk more about this uh, in details uh, with you offline. So how to get the ground truth? Uh, this is simple to think, you know, we just measure sea surface height, but actually it's extremely difficult because the requirement, and if, you, if we think about uh, in, in the back envelope calculation, uh, the requirement of the in, uh, instantaneous SSH should be below uh, five millimeter accuracy. Um, if we just measure the sea surface height, obviously the uh, surface wave will dominate. We have to average a large area to be the noise, and we do not have that capability for uh, in situ uh, platform. So we spend a lot of times uh, to figure out how. So first, we we conducted a uh, OSI uh, based on the hydrostatic equation. Uh, sea surface height can be influenced by bottom pressure, steric height due to density change in the surface height and atmosphere pressure. So that's that's basically an uh, equation that we can build on for the SWOT scale uh, ocean dynamics. So in this OSIS study, we have shown that in the California region, um, steric height can be used to represent the sea surface height at small scales. Uh, uh, steric height is a hydrostatic approach to measure SSH with no impact from surface process. 
other than interactions uh, for the inverted barometer effect and barotropic bur signals. And so the development after this has been focusing on uh, quantifying the error sources in getting accurate and steadily high. So we published this paper back in 2018 uh, for Aussie, but uh, after that, we move on to uh, the real field test. There, we have conducted, uh, conducted two field campaigns to test the feasibility of the in-situ platforms for ground truth reconstruction. Uh, today, I will mainly talk about the latest field campaign carried out between uh, September 2019 and January 2000, uh, uh, 20, uh, 2020. Uh, right, uh, we pick up the morning right before the government lockdown. So it was a very successful campaign. We we're very lucky on many accounts. Uh, seven institutions were involved. The campaign participants are listed here. You can see uh, later on from the recording. Uh, we have three moorings and two bottom pressure recorder deployed within a uh, swap crossover diamond along a Sentinel 3A ground track, which is the yellow line here. The northern mooring has a GPS buoy and uh, 18 fixed CTDs goes all the way from surface to the bottom. The middle mooring has a prolar sampling the upper 500 meters for temperature and salinity. The southern mooring uh, is a hybrid one with a wire worker sampling the upper 500 meters and fixed CTDs uh, below, um, sorry, below below the 500 meters all the way to the bottom. So all the data from G, uh, GPS, prowler, and the, the southern hybrid mooring were transmitted in real time, which is very very important for the satellite uh, cable uh, uh, task. So the two BPRs are located near the northern and the southern moorings. So the separation of the three moorings are 10 kilometers and 20 kilometers from north to south. Uh, a slow come glider flies along a 60 kilometer line perpendicular to the moor array between the middle and the northern mooring. Uh, so, so the glider also performed station keeping near uh, three moorings uh, for three to six days at each mooring. We just test the capability of the glider that stay close to the mooring uh, as a risk reduction. If one mooring fails, we can use a glider to substitute that. Um, there are uh, seven uh, uh, mission ob objectives for this campaign. Uh, I will mainly discuss three of them if I have time. Otherwise, I will just speed up and uh, uh, just briefly show the result. But I will be really, really happy to discuss the the, the details of the result later. Um, so um, the uh, the first one is the extent we can close the SSH equation based on the hydrostatic equation I showed earlier. And the second objective, uh, which I want to focus on, is the evaluate the vertical scale of the steric SSH and to what to what depth we need to observe the ocean uh, in order to understand the and the uh, small scale sea surface height variability. Uh, this will directly influence the design of the mooring uh, and and for the post launch field campaign. Uh, during this four month campaign, a massive scale eddy was formed near the Mormon array. We can see the process from the SSH contour map. It, start at, it started at the beginning of the campaign uh, as a meander of the California current. And by mid October, the meander started to deepen towards the coast. By late November, a warm core massive scale volcanic eddy was formed. This eddy and associated some massive scale features. Near the edge, where it's uh, clearly showing the high resolution SSH and the chlorophyll maps. Now, the SSH gradient uh, in panel uh, E, um, uh, SST gradient in panel E shows the intense submassive scale fronts along the edge of the eddy uh, where the three mooring array is located. So, the glider path cut through the edgy, eddy edge after it was formed. So, this really shows that there are a lot of rich information in this. Uh, in this set of observations, we have not yet explored. Um, so the data will be open uh, public by Podak soon. So you're welcome uh, to take a look if you have interest. Uh, we first compare the Morin Story Hide with AVSO graded product, uh, which is shown by the black lines. Um, and uh, uh, we can see that the, the color line is the Story Hide uh, from the Morin CTDs. And the black lines of AV. So we can see that you know to 
uh, uh, low frequencies, these two measurement uh, match pretty good. The RMS difference is between 1.5 to 1.7 centimeter uh, is well within the uh, a visual SSH error. Uh, it is also a good confirmation that the upper 500 meter stereo height does reflect what the current altimeter uh, me uh, uh, measurement. So I will skip quickly this one. We also compared to a long track Sentinel 3A uh, and uh, confirmed the, um, the consistency. Uh, this one is one of our major uh, uh, outcome of this campaign that we compared uh, the independent GPS measurement, bottom pressure measurement, uh, more in CTD measurement to get a stereo height and uh, use the atmosphere reanalysis for uh, inverted barometer correction. And then we plug into the hydrostatic equation. We are able to close the SSH uh, equation uh, within um, um, a reasonable uh, uncertainty. So the black, not the black, the, um, the blue line is the CTD derived steric height. The red line is the rest of the term in the hydrostatic equation. You can see they match pretty well, um, at least uh, uh, you know visible low frequency. If we calculate the difference and also plot as a function with significant wave height, you can see that they are linearly correlated. That means most of the error come from uh, GPS uh, due to surface waves. If the surface waves uh, are high, and then obviously you get largely GPS error. And, and uh, worth, uh, worth to see that this is already data. GPS will give us one hertz data, so we can average uh, 3,600 uh, samples to get a one hour and be the noise. Uh, but um, this is the first time GPS actually shown to have this accuracy, but on the other hand, confirmed that, that uh, the true sea surface observed by GPS, similar to uh, the quantity that will be observed by SWOT, is actually just upper ocean steric height. So this is another view, more comprehensive view of the stereo height uh, of the upper ocean versus the full depth. Uh, I will just skip these details, but the conclusion is that the upper 500 meter uh, stereo height account for majority of the stereo height. So uh, at the end, except the uh, low mode ties, we only need to observe the upper 500 meter uh, um, TNS to in order to reconstruct accurate star height. So this is uh, uh, an interesting experiment we did at the end of the campaign uh, that uh, the glider can do uh, pretty good uh, station keeping, stay close, very close to the mooring, conduct the, uh, the measurement that reconstruct the, um, the star height time series similar to uh, the mooring uh, time series. Start wrapping up. Okay. Uh, skip this. This is another view. Uh, this is the end um, of the uh, result for SWOT uh, based on the campaign and the RC and other works. Um, this will be the plan for the post launch campaign happening in the spring of 2023. Uh, we will have 11 mooring uh, along a line under uh, a SWOT crossover and a Sentinel 3 tracks. Um, will be about 30, uh, 300 kilometer west of Monterey. So quickly, next, uh, just to briefly uh, uh, for Wacom, uh, ocean winds has been long observed uh, radars, but the ocean currents is not. So this is the last, last uh, dynamical measurement of ocean surface that can be observed by satellite. By looking at the same surface from multiple direction, you can actually determine a vector currents and also provide a total surface current rather than geostrophic currents. Um, so this is, a, this is a concept has been proven by airborne uh, Doppler scat uh, conducted uh, recently by a team led by Ernesto. Um, so this scatterometry is, uh, is, uh, is being used also, um, 
for wind, but with additional um, Doppler capability will measure uh, the surface current. It's, it's still in a development phase proposal. Uh, the science goal examples can be ocean atmosphere chorosphere interaction, a two-way coupling of atmosphere and ocean and interaction with the biogeophysical uh, oceanography and climate, low latitude ocean circulation uh, where geosphere does not apply much, and also improve ocean coupling, reconstruction, reconstruction of the upper ocean circulation, uh, ocean transport, uh, both horizontal and vertical, also quantification of ocean heat and carbon uptake. Um, so this is just an advertisement that uh, the community engagement is encouraged. Uh, and the, the selected PI is Sarah Gailey, and uh, she is uh, hosting a weekly webinar started this week, um, on Tuesday, every Tuesday at 8 a.m. in Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, this is the information you can check out uh, the, uh, the recording later I will not uh, read. So, uh, so if you are interested in the development of this mission and uh, want to uh, contribute or participate in the, in the uh, community discussion, please join this webinar. With that, I will uh, conclude. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, maybe with the link to the webinar, you can send that to me and I'll distribute it to our e-list as well so everyone can have it. Sure. Yeah. Um, so any questions for Jimbo? I'll take the next two to three minutes for questions. Antonietta, do you have a question? Hey, I think there is also Shane. Um... <laughs> maybe you can go first. Please go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead, please. Yeah. So I was actually just a very uh, technical question. I was curious how close to the coast can you get with your measurements of sea surface height? It's, it's pretty close. Um, I do not have a specific number, but definitely within 10 kilometers. Uh -huh. Yeah. And the, and the other question is when you talk about the winds, surface winds, which it's true, we can get them from the reader, but I think uh, wind products are still, uh, um, there are discrepancies among them, and so they are still very much needed. Um, uh, so this, the winds at w which height? Are they like 10 meter heights, or are they given at the surface, or uh, can you have the stress for them? Yeah, yeah this is a good question. Uh, the uniqueness of uh, Wacom. Uh, if we talk about that, is the the I'll give the not wind uh, speed but wind stress, the, yes. so that it will take into account the relative velocity between atmosphere and the current already in the measurement. So we will we will get a wind stress rather than wind speed. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the overview. So you talked mostly about SWOT, which is, you know, about to launch, and we are very excited. But so when it comes to Wacom, you mentioned that you have this community webinar series, which is about to start. So where do you think the communities and, you know, specific communities such as US Clivar, us, uh, can play? What type of role can we play in the development of Wacom or any other satellite mission? Yeah, so I raised a question on on the Slack too, right? So uh, this is a question probably as a group, uh, we can discuss how, to what extent we can help them in development uh, and also without overburden ourselves. Um, so they are looking for, you know, Clivar support to have a broader community engagement in the early stage to form a you know, proposal to uh, nail down the science requirement and the science objective. So that's that's the current goal there the webinar. Uh, if we can advertise for them, if we can uh, bring a broad, broader community somehow, I think that's uh, that's something what we can do. That's that's my two cents. Thank you. Any other questions for Jim Bell before we head into the closed panel discussion? Mike? Jimbo, nice talk. Um, on the on the SWAT adopter crossover experiments, um, the map that you showed had uh, something like eight or so, eight to ten. Uh, eight to ten. Yeah, 
yeah. international campaigns that are being planned. Those include the Institute um, field campaign um, at those crossover sites. I noticed for the in near U.S. locations, um, we have the California Current, and then there's one. Um, what's the closest one in the East Coast? Um, in that, and you might pull up the map. Um, and the reason I ask is there's this upcoming workshop we have on Wither the Gulf Stream uh, that's going to focus on air-sea interactions in the Gulf Stream. And, and with the hope, I think, downstream of an observational campaign, in situ observational campaign. And um, I, I'm curious about the timing for the crossover and, and if there is one that sits out. Yeah, if we look out into the Gulf Stream region, we've got one crossover that's right off the coast, uh, looks like basically the mid-Atlantic coast. Yeah. Um, and then further out, the one that's um, just to the east of that, is that considered in the Gulf Stream eddy field? This one, yes. No, the, the next one over. This one. To the right, yes. Yeah, uh, that's right. This is more like a south of Gulf Stream. Right. But extension of Gulf, Gulf Stream, a lot of eddies there, and also uh, some eddies come out of uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea. And and again, what year will the um, field will these field campaigns be undertaken? What year or years? Uh, it's uh, it's in one year. It's the spring of twenty twenty three. Okay, so that's right yeah. around the corner. Okay. Yeah. So if uh, the the only there has been discussions uh, you know, with the East Coast uh, folks, um, the difficulty is funding. A lot of people have interest, but it's hard to get funding to do a real work. What what's um, who is funding the West Coast? Uh, the mission is funding the West Coast. The okay. SWAT project, yeah. Oh, the SWAT project is funding that. So that's NASA support, right? For that effort entirely, right? Okay, and so um, NASA supports which of these on this map? Is it just that California current just, one? Just that one. The other uh, other locations from different country and or different agency. Okay. Actually, yeah, actually for U.S. just this one so far. Okay. Well, and we and we should preface to Jumbo the reason why that sort of area is is uniquely chosen is given the past history with respect to all the altimetry missions, there's always been a CalVal site there. Exactly. So I think that's why they're targeting it because it's been sort of in this repeat um, sort of usage with respect to all the altimetry missions. There's that oil platform that typically had been using called Harvest. Oh, is that Things of that sort. Okay. Yeah. I, I think it's being decommissioned, but at least for this initial, it should still be in operation. What happens after that? Who knows? I have, I, but that's, I think, another reason why it's chosen. Just a side note on that, in terms of the use of oil platforms for um, our observing, our institute observing, <laughs> and uh, not only for the cal valve for the satellites, but also as an opportunity for um, other observing, right, in the marine atmospheric boundary layer and upper ocean, uh, that some lessons learned from harvest might be of value for um, other regions along our coastlines uh, as we're entering into this climate at the coast um, research challenge. So something to follow up on, I think, in post panel discussions. Yeah. So I also try to get as many as uh, as possible of uh, community contribution, in kind of contribution, because we have a backbone of eleven moorings. It will be good to take advantage of that, add on some specific other uh, measurement, and uh, with the, all this data available, we can reconstruct the ocean circulation, the physics there. Uh, at a small scale uh, to a very large and unprecedented you know, um, level of details. But again, funding is the issue. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> it always <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I see Shane has his hand raised. I think this will be the last question so that we don't cut too much into the tag up. Go ahead, Shane. Sean, uh, Jimbo, since you were showing the adopt crossover sites, is there a centralized site with all the list of those missions that could be uh, publicly available? Yes. Uh, yes, I will share okay. with you guys uh, later of a website. Yeah. One, one last question then. In terms of scientists who might want to also, are these teams already formed? Is this defined? Is there the ability for other scientists in the community to participate? 
Absolutely. It's formed, but it's continues to welcome new members. Okay. And so yep. we can help um, in that advertising and getting the word out within the community. That would be awesome. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think we should conclude the webinar portion here. So thank you, Jimbo.